Um, some of the more common causes of pulsatile tinnitus is um, high blood pressure. Um, uh, if your blood pressure is too high, the, uh, you can actually hear your blood close to your ear and um, excessive caffeine use can also cause it. So if you're drinking a lot of coffee, energy drinks, things like that can also cause pulsatile tinnitus. Hello everyone, welcome to the NJENT podcast, the We Knows Noses podcast. Um, Dr. Reddy and Dr. Smith, Dr. Good Smith to see here. you. Um, just a little bit of quick news about our practice, um, some exciting news. We have a new location in South Jersey, in Marlton, New Jersey, and we're um, serving the greater Philadelphia area as well as South Jersey area, um, close to Mount Laurel, and um, we're excited about our new space, so come see us if you ever need any ENT care. But today, for the first topic we're talking about is, um, is something very common. It's called tinnitus. The medical term is tinnitus. And that's basically um, uh, any, any noise that you potentially are hearing in your ear that's not supposed to be there. So, um, so yeah, I'll give so it to Dr. Smith to get started on. Perfect. So, um, yeah, as, as Dr. Reddy said, yeah, tinnitus, which is a uh, Greek, uh, or tenere, which is from the Greek word, um, which means ringing. You know, tinnitus can come in all forms. It could be hissing, ringing, buzzing, clicking, ticking. It's some noise that you're hearing in the ear. Now, most times that is something that only you're hearing. So we, um, that is not something that we, the physicians are hearing or somebody, a loved one sitting next to you. Um, and so we try to classify tinnitus as whether you're the only one hearing it subjective um, or if it's objective, like it can be heard out. And so of those, most commonly we have subjective tinnitus and of the subjective tinnitus, there are two major types and there's what we call pulsatile and non-pulsatile. Pulsatile is pretty simple. It feels, sounds like your heartbeat. And usually patients are pretty easy and quick to describe that. Um, you know, Dr. Reddy can maybe talk about a few quick causes that might cause some pulsatile tinnitus and we'll delve kind of mainly into the non-pulsatile subjective tinnitus. Yeah, so some causes of pulsatile tinnitus is um, if a blood vessel is too close to the inner part of your ear. And there's different kinds of blood vessels that can do that. Sometimes your carotid artery can be close to your um, inner part of the ear or some type of um, uh, vascular malformation. And um, sometimes your, your, your internal jugular vein, which is one of your big jugular veins in, that drains your, your head, uh, can also be close um, to the inner part of the ear, maybe because of some bony erosion or something like that. Those are quite rare. Um, some of the more common causes of pulsatile tinnitus is um, high blood pressure. Um, uh, if your blood pressure is too high, the, uh, you can actually hear your blood close to your ear and um, excessive caffeine use can also cause it. So if you're drinking a lot of coffee, energy drinks, things like that can also cause pulsatile tinnitus. Ringing, buzzing, clicking, ticking, th those sounds are typically they're generated by the brain. And so a lot of times patients come in and say to us like, hey, I, do, you know, I, I have this ringing in my ear, I, I heard there's nothing I can do for it. And you know, there, there's some truth to that, but it's not entirely true. There is something that can be done for it. Um, and that's kind of like what you need to see an ENT or one of us about is to trigger, try to figure out what you can do about it because not everybody's tinnitus is due to the same. So tinnitus, as I said, is kind of generated from the hearing center of the brain and it's there because of a lack of sound getting to that hearing center. So hearing loss is what typically causes tinnitus. And so that is somewhat true that some hearing losses, there's not much you can do about it acutely. Um, but there's plenty that, that can be. So if it's wax in the ear or a hole in the eardrum, fluid in the middle ear, or some fusion of the bones, sometimes it's a conductive hearing loss causing lack of sound getting to the brain. And sometimes it's a, it's a problem with what we call the sensory neural or the nerve pathway to the brain. So the cochlea can start to show some aging or some noise damage. Um, the nerve can have some damage and even the brain can have some damage leading to this tinnitus sound. So um, there is something that can be done. We talk to patients, typically we like to get a hearing uh, test, get a good exam of the ear canal, make sure there's nothing that looks uh, you know, easily apparent that could cause some hearing loss. Um, and because a lot of those things can be correctable. So if any of you have ever had like wax or fluid in the ear, often you may hear some tinnitus. 
Another common thing that may give you some tinnitus would be noise, noise exposure. So you may go to a loud concert or have some loud bang go near your ear and you may experience tinnitus for the next couple hours, next couple days. And that's just a temporary hearing loss that occurs from like a little concussion inside the middle or the inner ear called the cochlea. So, um, you know, as far as like workup, you know, I'll let Dr. Reddy talk to you a little bit about some of the workup that we normally would do during tinnitus. Um, and then we can delve more into some treatments. Yeah, so for the workup, we typically just start with an ear, nose, and throat physical examination. Um, we look at your ears, we look in your nose, we look at your throat, make sure there isn't anything that might be contributing to some um, outer ear or middle ear problems. And if there is, a, if there is something, we address it. Um, some of the common things, like Dr. Smith was mentioning, is earwax. And just a simple removal of earwax can, can oftentimes just make the tinnitus sound um, not as bad as it was before. Um, after that, we, we do the audiologic testing, and sometimes we, uh, depending on the hearing testing, we sometimes order some type of imaging studies too. It may be a CAT scan of the ear, it may be a MRI, but it just depends on what the workup kind of shows. Right. Yeah, I agree. And most most kind most normal tinnitus doesn't need, you know, imaging, but there are certain cases and that's why you need to see, you know, an ENT and an audiologist that it might require or might necessitate some sort of imaging. As far as the treatment goes, the you know, the number one thing that you know is for, first and foremost is protecting the hearing that you have. So knowing that you have a hearing loss is one thing, but then it may you know make protection even more important. So if you have some high frequency or age-related hearing loss or noise-induced hearing loss, we may recommend certain things to protect the hearing. So the most common way that we and deal with hearing um, have, uh, ringing from hearing loss is our brain habituates, which means it gets used to and accustomed to that loss of input and actually will start to get used to it and get rid of that tinnitus. And the vast majority of patients will habituate to the tinnitus that they experience as long as their hearing loss stays stable. So there are, you know, plenty of studies and uh, that help uh, as far as hearing uh, and and whiting out tinnitus that show that you know, amplification of hearing uh, can help with that habituation process. So sometimes it's something as simple as a hearing aid or improving uh, noise cancellation, so that when patients are exposed to significant noise exposure. And it might be something as simple as, hey, you know, you have noise exposure and hearing loss, you may need to, when you're doing yard work or something else that has a lot of noise, um, you may need to think about using protection more frequently, more often. And so there's a lot of counseling that goes with uh, tinnitus treatments. There are all sorts of, you know, over-the-counter treatments for tinnitus. Now, most of these haven't been shown to have any major statistical significance. And these are what we call the ringing vitamins. Um, a lot of these are uh, B-complex vitamins, uh, you know, lipoflavonoids, and things that have um, antioxidants to help increase the blood flow into the cochlea. And for the vast majority of patients, th those may not work. However, you know, certainly patients have tried them anecdotally and have shown some uh, um, improvement with the ringing. But if you look at what we tend to look at, which is evidence-based medicine, not a whole lot that we can say, okay, everybody should be on these tinnitus vitamins or ringing supplements. Um, of all the things that do help, you know, as with most things, these are kind of stress related as well. So in the brain, that hearing center has a real big connection to the stress anxiety center. Um, and in that brain, some people will get a real, real big um, input from the stress center and that hearing center. And so the big problem that a lot of people have with tinnitus is that they're just not able to habituate. And that's where most of the studies and most of the treatments are aimed at helping that habituation process. And so there's classes of antidepressant, um, anti-anxiety medications that can help. There's something called tinnitus retraining therapy, which is a type of cognitive behavioral therapy, which can help the patients habituate to tinnitus. And those things have had some um, you know, statistical significance in certain studies. So um, there are certainly things that can be done for tinnitus, um, but you know, it's not always a one size fits all. Um, yeah, the other thing is um, just avoiding certain triggers, right? Correct. So the, the most common trigger is um, aspirin use. Um, aspirin has been shown um, to actually make tinnitus worse for a lot of people. And in other people, it can be ibuprofen use. So something as simple as just switching from um, an over-the-counter ibuprofen use for pain relief to Tylenol may be helpful in some people. Um, and then the uh, Dr. Smith was alluding to uh, hearing aids, and some hearing aids they have what's called a masking feature, 
and the audiologist typically will employ this masking feature um, in for your particular type of tinnitus, the frequency of your tinnitus, to try to mask the noise. And it works similarly to having some type of background noise, like a pink noise or a white noise machine. Um, so that's that could be also very helpful. And in terms of monitoring over the long run, you know, it's just typically, you know, if you have tinnitus um, and it's noise induced, we usually recommend a just a surveillance exam once a year with a hearing test. Um, and uh, I think that's pretty much yeah. so all, sort of, of, all of it, right? So yeah, so yeah. to sum things up, you know, yeah. there is, you know, tinnitus, you know, don't, don't just shrug it off and say, oh, there's nothing that can be done. Certainly, yeah. you know, it definitely warrants an evaluation to see if there's something that's easily removable or improvable uh, from the hearing loss perspective. Um, as far as like the stress and anxiety that, that, that feeds it and can sometimes hurt and hinder the, the habituation process, there are things that can be done for that too. So um, as far as tinnitus goes, don't just think, oh, I'm stuck with this for life. You know, there are a lot of things that can be done for it. And sometimes it's just, you know, better education on tinnitus as itself. Um, so for that, um, Dr. Reddy, Dr. Smith, uh, thank you for joining us for our podcast. Please make sure to uh, like us and subscribe to us, uh, share, share it with a friend, um, rate us five stars, and join us next time. Great. Take care. Take care.